Hello, everyone. Welcome to JetBrains Connect, topics and talk from across the landscape of technology. Today on JetBrains Connect, African developers, for example, in open source, have a strong supply of talent. What they need most is opportunities. How can international companies give, but also get, African opportunity? I'm your host, Paul Everett. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Dahlia Abushayesha, JetBrains developer advocate on our Java advocacy team. Welcome, Dahlia. Hey, everyone. And uh, we're gonna, we have a lot to talk about with Dahlia, but also we have Marlene Mangami, vice chair of the Python Software Foundation, aka PSF. I'll say that quite a few times. Main organizer for the recent PyCon Africa, University of London comp sci student, how do you do all this stuff? Welcome, Marlene. Thanks for joining JetBrains Connect. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Guests usually go first on JetBrains Connect, but we have some framing that we need to do first. Dahlia, you and I talked about this. Neither the Python nor the Africa in this topic are really exclusive. It's a story kind of replicated and repeated across tech and emerging areas. Tell us your background, what you've done in Java, and kind of the Java story for pulling in talent from all around the world. Yeah, sure. Um, so just a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm originally from Egypt, and sometimes I have to point out that Egypt is in Africa. Um, I moved to the US when I was 12 and went to university for software engineering with a minor in philosophy. Marlene, I know we shared the love of philosophy. Um, and then I joined IBM as a Java developer right out of college. Um, so I have been doing Java for a very long time. I did some work on a product called WebSphere. And then later on, I became developer lead for a mi some migration tools. And then at the end of last year, I joined JetBrains as a Java developer advocate. And I've just had the pleasure of working with so many people across the world, so many user groups, a lot of people, the things that I can talk about with anyone from anywhere is our love of programming. And I think that's really great that you can collaborate with so many people everywhere. All right, and the philosophy point is a reference to a talk that Marlene gave at uh, PyCon this year, where she managed to integrate uh, philosophy into it. Marlene, I sat beside you at the PyCon PSF members launch a couple of years ago. Uh, PSF is the Python Software Foundation. I've got a really vivid memory of us sitting beside each other, my first introduction <laughs> to talking to you. Now, you've been on the board for three years, on the board of the Python Software Foundation. Tell us your story. What was it like getting started on this journey of kind of making change? Sure. I think for myself, I've had a really sort of unconventional introduction into the tech space. And I, I started off studying molecular biology and I was studying it outside of the country in the United States, in Pennsylvania, which is very cold. Um, and then I had some time where I came back home and I, during that time, I decided that I wanted to do something that was more connected to my local community. And I wanted to start empowering young women um, like myself to be able to have access to technology. So a lot of the technology that I had um, encountered in the United States, I didn't see that same technology or the same access to it um, locally. And so I wanted to provide a space for young women to have those opportunities. So I started an organization called Zimbo Pi. And um, through that organization, I connected with the global Python community, which is much larger than I expected and also much friendlier um, than I expected as well. Paul is, is part of that community and yes, we, we sat together. Um, and so I think it was during the time when I was volunteering that I got introduced to Lorena, who was serving on the board of directors for the Python Software Foundation at the time. And she encouraged me to run for the board of directors um, 
just because of, I guess, the work I was doing with Zimbo Pi, which is a nonprofit. And the PSAF is a nonprofit organization. And so it was kind of through that that I, she convinced me to run when I really felt like, I don't know, Africa is really far from America and from the technology space. Um, but I ran and I got voted in and it was really, really exciting. And it's been such a great opportunity. Um, through that, I've been able to uh, sort of meet Pythonistas from across the world. Um, from within the continent of Africa as well, and have started sort of chairing as well the the, the Pan African Python community as well. So it's been really fun. It's been really good. Very good. And in the show notes, we'll link to some of the talks and interviews that uh, Marlene's given over the years that tell more of the story. We're going to talk about international companies and talent in emerging areas. In this case, Python developers in Africa, and we're going to get specific, but first we kind of need an understanding of the topic. Marlene, give us a synopsis of tech and open source and Python in Africa. Uh, just get us up to date on where things are now. Um, well, it's been really interesting uh, being part of the Python community and in the tech community in general in Africa over the past few years. And um, I think you know, it's it's really, really exciting. There were some stats recently in 2019, actually, uh, uh, GitHub published their State of the Octaverse report. And in that report, they mentioned that Africa actually is the is the number one place for, it's the fastest growing place for developers in the world. So we have probably the highest number of developers coming up, uh, new developers every um, over the, or the over the course of 2019, I'll have to check uh, for this year's. But I think that was really exciting. Um, something else is that we are really seeing a lot of conferences coming up all over the world, all over Africa, and uh, this is really exciting. We're seeing, um, I think. Since I started actually in the Python community, sort of organizing, we saw I have seen about double the conferences um, over the year, and and that's been really exciting to see conferences coming up um, from regions that there weren't conferences anymore. And I think it's just a testament to how much people are interested in the Python programming language, how much people are interested in computer programming in general, and uh, so we've really seen a lot of growth there as well in the startup space as well. We have a lot of new businesses coming up, so uh, the growth has. Been really really great yeah double double's a good number and uh when we were talking before boy we could do a whole episode on the startup space uh dahlia when you and i first you and i had a lot of fun researching this and when we were talking about it you were really interested in africa meaning kind of a exemplar of a set of trends and factors outside of python outside of open source and even outside of the region Definitely. I think as we were doing more and more research into this episode, we found that a lot of the lessons that we can learn from other countries or on other continents is you start with underrepresented groups where, you know, we were very America focused, we're very Europe focused, but the other continents kind of get left behind. And the more we bring in those folks, the more we get that diversity perspective, the richer the experience is for everyone else. So I was really interested in, okay, what are we doing right in other areas? And how can we do that for folks in Africa, folks in other uh, places like South America and so on and so forth? So I'm very interested in exploring that. Uh, very good. And we'll keep, the, and I say we, we, the three of us, but we, the royal we, all of us in the audience, we'll keep that in mind during this discussion. That brings us to the core issue. Africa has a talent supply. International companies have a talent demand. Each have opportunities for the other. What are the barriers and what are some practical steps that can be taken? Marlene, you've spoken on this topic, um, and I've really enjoyed several of the things that you've said and you've written. Explain to us the talent opportunity with African developers, and then what do they need most? Right. So I think there's a huge opportunity for um, 
for finding talent on the continent of Africa. Um, like I said, it's one of the fastest growing places for, um, for developers in the world. And I think, you know, there's so many people who are creating new projects, um, who are creating new businesses, and that's been really interesting to, to see as well. Um, but I think there, there are, like you said, there are lots of challenges associated with that as well. Um, one thing is that our developer communities and the industry is, is really young. So, you know, a lot of the developers that are in the community are um, still looking for experience. And something that's really difficult sometimes is finding people who are willing to hire junior developers because, um, you know, companies right now and and particularly even in Africa I think a lot of people maybe the first thought is why don't African companies just hire all the African developers um, since there's a talent shortage um, but a lot of the African startups that are coming up in the tech space are also fairly fairly new and so those startups are looking for more experienced developers to get them off the ground um, and so we find ourselves in this situation where we have all this young talent but they need experience they need um, you know internships to train them they need um, some sort of a pathway to get jobs and um, yeah I think there's there's been some models for for example, there was a company in Africa called Andela that tried to build around this model of um, of hiring junior developers to for remote companies internationally. But recently, they they've actually had to to actually let go a lot of their junior developers because uh, the market right now seems to only be looking for experienced devs. And that's that's really, it's, it was quite, I, I know for Andela's situation, that was really disappointing for a lot of people. And um, yeah, so I really hope that in some way we can, we can find pathways to give uh, these young developers more experience. Yeah, it's fun when you say, young developers and i think uh i give a talk called python 1994 and i used to ask what were you doing in 1994 but then the audience started saying waiting to be born so i stopped asking yeah that. um Dalai, I, was not, I, I had just been born in 1994 I, but yeah i had just <laughs> yeah, yeah so that's the definition of young i think uh, Dolly, when you and I discussed this, the part that you really zeroed in on with um, Marlene's discussions about practical steps, is that the part that you were really interested in? Yes, definitely. I think we recognize that there is some barriers and some challenges. And I really like to think about, okay, how can we make forward progress, however small, however big, how can we make forward progress? How can each of us help a little bit so that we can have growth and we can see improvements in this area? So I, I really want to zero in on, okay, practical steps. How can we do uh, what we can to bring more opportunities, especially job opportunities, uh, not just, you know, uh, Join open source, work on open source. Well, what does that mean for someone that's looking to bring in income for their families and, you know, a practical, uh, useful experience for developers? Right. And that was um, the part of what uh, you really seemed to be interested in was there's a time for talking. There's a time for doing. And when it's time to be doing the doing part, all of us have a role and whether we're someone who can just talk about it or help um, developers on their journey or all the way up to, I run a company and I have opportunities. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we've got the core issue framed. Let's move on to an open discussion. Okay, on to some of the points. Dahlia, your story is instructive about the opportunities. It kind of frames the key issue here. Uh, could you go into this a little bit more? Sure. Um, so I had not thought about this in a while. And then after we started talking about this episode, I reflected back on my personal experience. Um, my parents had had to leave Egypt to look for better opportunities. And then later, when I was 12, I had to move to the United States, um, leaving behind my home, leaving behind my, my friends, my extended family, 
all the stuff. So it was, I remember it being very painful. Um, and for me, I saw it as I have to compromise. I have to either have home or I have opportunities. So for me, I had to choose to go somewhere else looking for opportunities to pursue a better future. And it's a choice that a lot of my friends and family back in Africa have to make. Um, and for I just would like people to not have to make that compromise. Right. And uh, that's something that's really important for all of us as we're learning about this is some of these choices are hard choices. And when you and I were researching and talking about it, you had some thoughts kind of about uh, the choices for the next generation coming up. Yeah. So, you know, I'm very grateful for what I have, you know, the opportunities I got and how things turned out for me. Um, but I can't help but think about like, you know, when I was that young, um, what if I had opportunities next to me? What if I didn't have to compromise? What if I could, you know, have a program like Marlene's where they're teaching me to code early on? There is a path where I can find those really great dev jobs and still be around my family and community and friends and all that stuff. And I wish folks in future generation, future Dahlia's, they don't have to make that choice. Um, the more we bring those opportunities, the more we spread them out, the better chance it will be that people can have it all. And that's my biggest wish is someone can have it all. They can have their community, their home, their job, everything around them, and they don't have to compromise. And Marlene, uh, Dolly just kind of made reference to it. It sounds a little bit like your story and your experience coming back from your time in the States. And then even though you're really young, you're thinking about the next generation and you started Zimbo Pi. Yeah, hundred percent. I think it's so important for us to be forward looking and to think about, you know, when we have opportunities that we get um, to be able to, when we have, you know, good opportunities, how can we make it easier for other people not to struggle as much as we did? And a hundred percent like Dalia, I think I was, um, thinking right off the bat, you know, how can I, I, I didn't have access to a computer. Well, I mean, I think my family got access to a computer when I was maybe a teenager at some point. And, um, and most of the time my brothers were just playing games with it. And I didn't know that you could actually create things with the computer by yourself. Um, and I think just having the opportunity to teach other people and to make life easier for someone else is, is such a gift. And it's so important that we, we think like that, I think. So it's important. <laughs> okay. On to two things, uh, getting into the topic, um, in, in getting into moving from thinking to doing, uh, organizing communities, kind of middle management, being an amplifier, uh, these things that you've been doing in recent years, when did the idea of a PyCon Africa, kind of a Pan-African conference, when did that originate? What need was it addressing? And what did it take to join up all those efforts? Um, so I think it was, so it originated when I, I remember I had just joined the board of directors and something that the board, they encourage you to do as a director on the board is to attend different Python conferences. And so uh, um, for me, some of the, the closest ones to me were, were in Africa. And uh, I was really interested as well in seeing other African countries. And so, so from then I decided that I wanted to um, go to, I think I, I started by going to PyCon Namibia. And uh, when I was there, there were so many people that were interested in the Python community in Zimbabwe, and they wanted to know, uh, you know, what we were using Python for, how we were, what which projects we were building. Um, and the same thing happened when I went to PyCon Ghana, um, which is in Western Africa, and 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 just next door for Py PyCon Nigeria. And I think everyone was really curious about what we were all doing and we all had the sense of okay 
I mean, the U.S. has this conference that's huge and everyone can kind of go there each year and see each other again. Um, and, you know, Europe has also this, this great conference and we'd love to do the same thing. Um, so I think there was a lot of wanting a space where we could all come together again and uh, we could see each other. There, were, I mean, a number of, of us had, had traveled from outside of our own countries. Um, and just to have one place we knew each year that we could go to was, was a, a big motivation for that. And there were also lots of, um, I think there was also a, a desire for collaboration between the different countries. So that was part of it as well. Um, and then actually planning the conference took a while for me because we talked about it for a long time. We, we talked a lot, like we talk about, you know, uh, you know, thinking versus action. I think it took me a full two years before I decided I was actually going to, to start actively planning this conference. Um, so it was just deciding to, ha to make the commitment and, and plan it that took a while, but I think the desire for it was always there. And that's always a good reminder that if we ever get to go back to conferences in person, go hug your conference organizer because it is an infinite amount of work to pull off. Um, <laughs> there's something that you, you, you talked about and you had kind of a sequence of points that really painted the picture for me and really drove the point home. There's a huge demand for programming. Uh, some call it a crisis in our industry. And here in Africa, you've got this huge supply and it's young, it's talented, it's kind of digital native, native it's really driven. You've talked about this a little bit. What are some of the inefficiencies and barriers causing the demand and the supply to not meet up? Well, I think, um, I think there are probably a lot, there's, there's probably a lot that goes into that. Um, one thing that comes to mind is, is sometimes people just are not aware that there's still a lot of, I think there's still a lot of miseducation about Africa, for example. I think a lot of people are still unsure if Africa has electricity at the moment, um, <laughs> or worse, the internet. People are just unsure about those things. Um, and so I think there is, there still needs to be a lot of education um, to let people know that, hey, there's a lot of capacity in Africa and people really are smart here and people can use computers. And I think it's something that, you know, shows like this are important for, so people uh, are aware of this. Um, something else is that there are, there are barriers to remote work. So I think that it's, 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 it would be lovely to have companies from outside <clears throat> of Africa uh, hiring African developers, but there are quite a number of barriers. I know for American, com for European countries or American companies, sometimes there's tax issues. Um, sometimes as well in Africa, there are some hardships in terms of, um, for example, the price of the internet here is quite expensive. And so, you know, even just connecting with those opportunities, I know a lot of people that have been hired from uh, participating in open source work. And you, even for me, part of the way I currently got my, my current job was really being part of the open source community. But a lot of people uh, sometimes will not have the extra income to be able to to do that or to have the extra time. Um, open source is still seen as a privilege, and I do think it's a certain to a certain extent it is a privilege to be able to contribute. Um, and so those are yeah, there there are still a lot of challenges. I think. Yeah, and you know, as you're talking about challenges, a lot of times I find it helpful to look at other examples of other uh, countries and how they've done. You you know, you spoke at uh, PyCon India, and I've al always admired what India has done with bringing in opportunities, bringing in uh, or being represented. Even when I'm, you know, watching educational videos, a lot of them are done by Indian teachers. And I think that's really awesome. So what, what if anything, can we replicate um, 
that India has done in Africa? Or is there any lessons that you see that we can uh, learn when we're talking about uh, Africa? Yeah, 100%. I think um, India is a great example of, uh, India has, I think they have, they're a success story um, that they had a lot of the same challenges that many African countries face but have somehow managed to rise above that and create this amazing industry. When I was there, I, um, it was the PyCon India when I attended was in Hyderabad. I think it was in 2018, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but it was huge. I mean, there were so many developers. It was one of the big, I think it was the second biggest outside of PyCon US. I think it was the biggest uh, PyCon I've ever been to. And um, there were so many sponsors. And something that I was super interesting to see is how many uh, of these big tech companies actually have headquarters in Hyderabad and um, other play in other cities. And it was super interesting to see that and to see also um, the structures that the community has built for itself to be able to allow people, for example, like you said, like tutorials to self-educate. I mean, I've, I am pausing my, my degree right now because of Indian professors on YouTube <laughs> teaching me <laughs> when I don't understand things. And I think that uh, they've built a lot of things within their community to, uh, to make things easier. And I, there are lots of, of things that I can, we can learn from them, for sure. So following up on that, and that's a great point about what we can learn. Um, what do tech communities in Africa actually need from international companies, kind of the mainstream software world? What, do, what is it going to take for us to be kind of codependent peers? Hmm. Um, I think that a lot, I think that one, <laughs> I would love to see the same um, investment that big tech has put, Big, I'm using that term generally for tech companies, mm -hmm. the larger tech companies. Um, big tech has put in India, you know, they have so many headquarters there that hire hundreds, thousands of engineers. And uh, I don't see that same level of investment in the engineering community here on the continent. Um, I, I know, you know, several big tech companies that will have very large marketing offices, very large sales offices, and uh, they, you know, they will have all these these offices, but almost no engineering offices, or maybe they will have like 10 engineers. Um, and I don't think that's a great, particularly when you, if those big tech com companies are still encouraging people to use their product, their products, or if they're having clubs or things like that, that just like encourage people to use their products, but don't actually hire them for job opportunities. Then I think that, you know, the, the investment isn't really long term in those cases. It helps to an extent, but in the long run, I would love to see more um, big tech companies actually, uh, you know, having large engineering offices in in these major countries um, and investing back into the community. And I'm thinking with the pandemic, you know, there is a lot of drawbacks, challenges, but the nice thing about it is that more and more companies are realizing how much you can do remotely. So geography is becoming not as much of an issue for companies and, you know, we're building infrastructure that lets more and more people working remotely. Even for conferences, you know, it used to be you have to have a budget and send certain people. And, you know, I had to have a million reasons, you know, to justify my travel. Uh, but now that a lot of the conferences are free and virtual, that really makes conferences more accessible and opens up opportunities for folks that maybe have not had those chances before. So have you seen any differences with the pandemic, um, changes, uh, positive or negative for opportunities for Africans? Yes, 100%. Like what you said, I think that um, 
remote has been fantastic. Um, I, I think there's just more access to things these days because um, you know, one thing that has been a challenge in the past, for example, has been visas. So a lot of the big, the big conferences are in Europe or in America and visas are very difficult to get. I mean, of the American visa, I have been denied several times um, <laughs> an American visa. And uh, I think that makes it, it really difficult because conferences are a great place to, for opportunities. Conferences are a great place for you to network and get job opportunities, for example, um, or just grow your knowledge. And so being remote, uh, it's been very interesting to be able to see um, a lot of Africans attending some of these um, these bigger conferences, speaking as well. I think the diversity at these conferences has been higher. Even um, I would say as well um, for African conferences as well. Uh, it's been really nice to have international speakers attend. I, Paul actually spoke at PyCon Africa um, this, this year at, uh, on a panel, and it was really, really great. So just that the, the opportunity that's currently there for collaboration is just improved because of, um, yeah, just because of more remote things for the, in the pandemic. <laughs> And uh, Dolly's point about, you know, real practical things and examples of success stories. And in that interview that you did with Kate, um, what's her last name? I, I won't get her name correctly. Okay. She gave a great example of a success story, the kind of thing Dolly is asking about. Uh, in the AI world, there's four big conferences each year. They decided that there was so much talent for, for AI coming from Africa that they were going to sponsor um, visas so that these incredibly good developers could go to conferences to the point that one of the big four conferences made the decision to move the conference to Africa. Did I get that right? Yes, <laughs> that's yeah. correct. And I mean, it was supposed to be last year, I think, but because of the pandemic, it, it wasn't in person. But yes, absolutely. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> and so that's an example of thinking is good, doing is better, and... Think good things can happen. Uh, this isn't just a case of wishing for a better tomorrow. You can go out and make a better tomorrow. Um, so speaking of real practical viable solutions, let's talk a little bit about the PSF and the Python Software Foundation. And in 2011-ish, I think I've got the dates right on this, Jessica McKellar was a director. And the PSF decided, they looked and they saw 1% of the PyCon talks were by women. Maybe we ought to do something about it. So not only did they talk about doing something about it, they came up with a plan. They had an engine, a platform. They had money. All three of those things coming from the conference called PyCon. And I'm looking at her numbers. In 2012, it was 7%. In 2013, 15%. The next year, 33%. The next year, 34%. So in just a couple of years, they moved from can we do something to we did it. So uh, with the work you're doing now with the PSF and your um, working group, do you can you look forward a little bit and think about um, the PSF or institutions like that that can be an engine for change? Yeah, 100%. I think that's such a great example for um, of just really taking um, these ideas and all of these good feelings <laughs> about wanting to change the world and actually putting them to, into action. And um, I know for myself, uh, I think the, the PSF Board of Directors, for example, has been really, um, has really wanted to be uh, more intentional about increasing the diversity in our community and not just increasing it um, in, in just certain aspects so not just like um, in, in not just women for example with the Jessica McKillar example um, which is fantastic but also even pushing that further and uh, so right now uh, we've just launched the diversity and inclusion work group and our work group has members from every single 
uh, continent in the world with the exception of Antarctica. So if anyone is watching this as, and is from Antarctica, please message me. Um, but we, in that, as part of the, the goals of that group is that we want to hear from communities around the world. We want to know how can the PSF best support um, communities in Indonesia? How can the PSF best, um, you know, allow core developers to start coming out of Zimbabwe? Um, and how, how are we able to do this in a strategic way? And so right now the group has just started, but we are discussing different sort of strategies to be able to try and, and, and make that happen. And also talking, you know, we would love to see more funding going to certain projects um, to be able to see that happening and mentorship as well. Um, so I would love to see um, in the next few years a lot more diversity in the Python community everywhere around the world. And um, also just to see, um, yeah, I, I think also just to see a lot more uh, connection between our communities. Um, so meeting more people from different countries who are interested in Python as well as something I would like to see. Yeah, it's, it's so much fun talking about this, these kinds of things and seeing that change really can happen. I got to say, there's something about this topic that's really activated my little gray cells, as Poirot would say. Uh, let's go deep on the closeout. Dahlia, I'll start with you. And in some ways, you're part of this story. Uh, what's the one thing you want our listeners to really think about and perhaps act on? Yeah, so I think each one of us has unique and valuable experiences that can really benefit other people. Um, and I think if we could just sit down, think about what can I do to make a positive impact on someone that has less opportunities than me, I think that would make such a big impact. You know, it can be small, it can be big, it can be, you know, mentoring someone or teaching them skills that you have and are passionate about. Um, it can be donating a laptop to so many developers that don't have access to laptops or, you know, they're writing code on their phones or even on a notebook. Um, it can be donating money to organizations. And uh, th there are so many out there that make a really big difference for folks and their families. And, you know, remembering that it could, it can be any one of us that maybe has more or less access to opportunities. So if you do have access to opportunities, spread those around. Uh, if you're in a position where you can advocate for your company to bring job opportunities to, you know, places like Africa, I think that is so beneficial. Um, so again, whatever you can do, you know, big or small, I think it's it's great if we just come in and lift each other up. Um, so if each of us takes the time to help, I think we can make a really positive impact that will uh, last generations to come. I had to resist the temptation to just kind of jump up and say, yeah, that, uh, what, what you just said was perfect. Um, Marlene, you've spoken on this a lot over the years. You've been an amplifier for this, which I think is so great. Let's close this episode out by kind of looking forward, maybe your PSF efforts, maybe your PyCon Africa efforts. Where would you like the Python in Africa story to be maybe three years from now? Um, I think I, you know, I think I'm really optimistic about the future and I would love to see, you know, we're already seeing Africans breaking barriers in the technology industry, and we're already seeing so many people from across the world coming together um, to be able to make, you know, to make our the world better by with technology. And um, I think I would love to see in three years from now um, more core developers that are diverse. <laughs> so I would love to see an African, a second African one. Right now there's one African core developer. I would love to see a second one. And also someone from another country that is outside of Europe and America. Um, I would love to see um, generally developers from everywhere across the world um, 
collaborating more. I would love to see more open source projects that are um, open to people from around the world and that have collaboration um, with people from different communities. And, and yeah, I, I just think in general, I would love to see Python being used anywhere and everywhere. Um, I'm very excited <laughs> to see where, will we, where we will be uh, in three years from now, for sure. Wonderful and inspiring. Let's do it. That's it for today's JetBrains Connect. Marlene, thank you very much for being with us, telling the Python in Africa story. And really, thanks for everything that you're doing for Python and the PSF. No problem. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Dahlia, loved working with you on this episode. Thanks for all the work you put in for this episode. See you next Friday for the Avocado Happy Hour. Yes. And thank you so much, Marlene, for joining us. This was really inspiring and I loved working on this. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Fabia. Yeah, it was so fun hearing from you as well. I will, I would love to jump for the avocado happy hour. <laughs> Maybe next up. Yeah. Thanks for watching this episode of JetBrains Connect, topics and talk from across the landscape of technology. Want more? We got more. Click the subscribe button down below. See you next time. <laughs>